So we are you connecting to the solitude. You mentioned the open path that brings you to the balance. And then once emptiness creates, you go into the spiraling of the energy to the bones and move out from that. So in terms of the solo work that I do, the resistance-based mobility work that I do, um, they generally start from gross and move to the subtle. So at the grossest level, how you approach it is basically um, characterized as floating the resistance. This is the final quality of the balance. Uh, coming in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, where would <laughs> listen to me now? Folks know that I dabble in a lot of different movement modalities and martial arts, so they've been wondering or they've been asking me, um, what arts or how what does my training look like? How do I personally train? What do I personally train? outside of when I dabble in these, all these different modalities. So, um, to be honest, when it comes to the internal arts, I, when it comes to my solo practice, I don't do a lot of things that people would associate normally with the internal arts in the sense that um, I don't do a lot of the forms and I don't really do a lot of the push hand stuff. Um, I mean, of course, you can't do push hand stuff in solo practice, but um, generally speaking, I don't actually do a lot of push hand stuff or any partner work. There was a time in my life when I did an extreme amount of partner work where my training was hugely composed of partner work, and that was when I was starting out in the internal arts. The first three, four, five years, it was extensively hands-on partner work. But as I've gotten a better hang of things, um, the solo practice has become more and more important to me. And my solo practice has um, shifted towards mostly um, solo training that involves various types of resistance and mobility work. And they're not really the traditional forms as people know it, like it is more, if you if you are from the Chinese arts background, they are more of the Jiben Gong type, which are basically fundamental or preparatory exercises, rather than forms themselves. And uh, to be honest, I don't think there are special magical forms that give you magical skills. I mean, people like to be special and people, you know, want to believe and people can be delusional. Like, moving in a particular way is not going to give you magical skills with the exception of, say, functional power across a wide range or um, certain specific things that stimulate certain aspects of development. Um, but again, these aspects of development are simply facets of the final product, they're not the final product. In fact, most of the internal art styles that I actually know that I would consider to be quite complete and authentic in that, in the sense, in terms of the training methods, they actually go through a large variation or large compendium of movement technologies progressively. Like they don't keep doing the same thing throughout the training progression. Like there are certain things that are geared towards uh, specific aspects or emphasize specific aspects at certain stages. But once that stage has been embodied, those things are hardly, if ever, revisited. So I don't think there are any ma magical methods of movement, particular secret forms or whatever they may be, that give you any special powers except potentially emphasizing specific aspects that may not be emphasized elsewhere. So anyway, I digress.
what that means is that whichever the inner method that you're using, you basically take a resistance and you run your method through to the point where there is this experience of the resistance disappearing and it becoming very, very light. So what happens with some of the methods that I train is that um, it could be that the resistance gets connected through the body to the ground so that there's a lot of support from the ground to um, do whatever you want to do with the resistance. Or it may be it is supported through uh, the stretch in your body uh, through particular muscle tendon lines. The elastication of this tissue will support large amounts of the weight, not just exertion pushing that resistance away or pulling that resistance. And um, furthermore, if you go deeper to some of the pung based martial arts, you would have the viscoelastic structure basically distributing the load across your entire structure such that the resistance is supported whether it's pushing or pulling without you specifically pushing or pulling it. So this experience is what we call floating. And like I said, there's many, many methods to get there. So, um, for example, one of the earliest methods that was um, introduced to me to do this was uh, we are Sifu Mark Rasmus. Um, he does some foundation work where you work with what he calls life force. And when working with life force, what happens is that you tend to um, acquire a viscoelastic body very, very quickly. And um, the sensation of supporting the resistance, whether it's pushing or pulling, through this viscoelastic structure or the feeling of life force, if you're talking about the inward experience, is basically the first method that I learned in terms of resistance training. And uh, I would consider this a foundation method where you start from the growth in the sense that you're using your entire structure to support the load. And uh, within this resistance, once you can float it or support it, you can start uh, going two ways. You can start uh, exploring your balance by basically uh, shifting your balance while floating this resistance or while having this resistance floated. So you learn to ex experience how in this particular state or particular condition or configuration your body changes to preserve your balance. And this teaches your uh, nervous system options to maintain your balance while sustaining an external resistance without directly, specifically exerting yourself to counter it. And um, so this next one would be to actually mobilize within this structure so that you release a particular part of the structure which creates a structural deformation and that change will basically propel the resistance away from you in the direction that you want to. Now you can add to this by stretching deeper in the muscle tendon lines or in the elastic tissue by creating this functional strength along these muscle tendon channels. So basically what you're doing is that by letting go of some parts of the structure, you're loading the elastic cated or elastically strung viscoelastic structure in such a way that certain elastic components 
have to increase the elastic tension or the exertion to maintain that elasticity and have the feeling of floating maintained. I'm going to take my hands, turn them around like this, right? And I'm going to squeeze them. So as I squeeze them, you see, squeeze. See how the power is being generated from the legs? And the hands are actually kind of moving backwards in a way, relative to the body. So the elbows are not going forward like this. It's not projecting forward, right? This is why it confuses people because the arms are not moving towards them, right? So when I squeeze, the elastic stretch and the hydraulic power comes off the leg. <coughs> so that's the power generation in this unusual mechanism. So this is a little different to what we normally would do consciously because unconsciously this happens all the time when you're maintaining a balance and stability. But when you're doing actual work, what we normally experience is that the extreme contraction of a muscle beyond the, beyond the level of muscle fiber engagement we are talking about here. When we are doing that, the muscle enters a stiff range, basically in the conventional modality, the muscle enters a range where the yeah, muscle fiber right. engagement is so high that the muscle loses its elasticity, especially under low frequency vibrations. Um, I don't mean in woo sense, I mean in the actual physical sense, physical mechanical vibrations. Uh, it loses the elasticity and the low frequency mechanical vibrations that it actually starts becoming stiff. And uh, the changeability within the muscle in terms of the muscle shape changing and the configuration changing becomes very, very limited. Now, if a muscle is completely placid, the muscle really doesn't have a shape. It can basically be stretched in any direction you want. So what we are doing is that we are operating within a range where we, where we maximize the elasticity of the muscle by a certain recruitment of a certain percentage of fibers while maintaining the adaptability of the muscle to be able to change shape and propagate longitudinal compression waves through the muscle. resistance training, what happens is that you would basically um, release a certain part of the viscoelastic tensor grade structure so that some of the other elastic components or elasticized muscle, tendon, ligament, fascia components end up having to stretch more and by recruiting more fibers there, you increase the elasticity, the elastic tension thereof, the elasticity coefficient thereof, and um, strengthen and stimulate the development of that muscle tendon channel. So, uh, muscle tendon channels are basically similar to what, uh, what are called myofascial meridians or myofascial, myofascial uh, channels or anatomy trains by Thomas Myers and a whole lot of people following that. The Chinese systems find, sometimes find granularity within these physical muscle tendon channels and they find coordination between disparate muscle tendon channels. So they tend to work as a different circuit as opposed to anatomy trains myofascial meridians themselves would be purely based on uh, physical connectivity.
So anyway, so this is uh, basically the modality of resistance training work um, with the with the internet. And uh, now within this, like I said before, we go from the gross to the subtle. We start with the entire structure, and then we start working with individual circuits like Jinlu or the uh, five paths in Taiji, as in eight gates and five paths. And uh, from that onwards, we can basically start manipulating how much actual organs get involved in this process, and so on and so forth. So it can get very subtle. Uh, it can go very deep. For example, it can basically um, start stretching the periosteum, which is around the bone, for example. Now, this doesn't mean that we are actively using fascia in a contractile fashion to generate power. That's not happening at all. Fascia is not a replacement for muscle power in terms of active contractility. It simply doesn't happen. Fascia is largely responsible for maintaining shape of various structures in the body. And yes, they store trauma in the sense that these various shapes can get deformed over time or due to uh, physical trauma or accidents or so on and so forth. So, but fundamentally, fascia actually maintains or governs the shape of the structures of our body. And we don't actively contract this to generate power in the internal arts. But fascia is basically used as a medium of force transmission or force communication and a neurological substrate within the internal arts by gently allowing the fascia to stretch in the entire structure. So you're not actively contracting them, but they're passively being contracted by the muscle that are partially activated. So, for example, like one of my best teachers, he used to translate Yi Jing Jing, which is usually translated as muscle tendon changing, as changing the quality of muscle to match those of the tendon or ligaments. So, basically, what he was talking about was engaging the muscle fiber partially to the point where the properties of the muscle and the properties of the tendon are matched fairly evenly within a certain range around that so that you can actually transmit longitudinal pressure waves with the maximum efficiency through them because if you if you're into electronics you'll understand the concept of impedance and voltage standing wave ratio and things like that so in a very similar way mechanical waves can actually transfer through these me a medium composed of ligaments tendons, fascia, and muscle, provided that muscle also had a quality that is close to that of tendon. So basically, this is how we um, use our body in especially the punk based internal arts. Now, when I say going from gross to subtle, as I described, we go all the way down to closer to bone and how the bone is connected to the rest of your structure. If you look at how, how the blood vessels connect with the bones and how the bones are innervated, you will recognize that the bones are not completely separate through a clean, opaque interface with the rest of the, the, rest of the body, but it's actually a rather porous interface between the bones and the body and the periosteum that wraps around the bones actually has has a lot of function associated with it. So by basically configuring our bodies in such a way that um, the forces end up affecting the periosteum by stretching it and in particular ways, we stimulate uh, board development and all sorts of other things. So uh, I don't want to get too much into the science of this because I'm not writing a research paper. I don't want people to misinterpret what I'm saying. But in a nutshell, this is kind of what happens. Now, um, in terms of training, uh, resistance training, um, I would I do standing work where I would actually do a lot of the standing exercises that a lot of people do, but I would actually do it with resistance. And uh, the reason why I do it is that I find that the 
changes that are stimulated that happens in the body happens a lot faster when you're bearing loads in certain ways rather than if you were just standing there or just holding postures and the second most important thing with standing work is harmonizing with the breath meaning that there is a certain cycling of the tissue that needs to happen for the breath to enter and exit the body and when you're holding standing postures breath needs to enter and exit the body while maintaining the conditions that we are main, trying to maintain in the posture so they cycle in a certain way to facilitate breathing and in each posture this is different this stimulates different organs different channels stimulate different types of development and so on and so forth so in any kind of ding shi or like um, any kind of standing posture work harmonizing with the breath is extremely important such that you are harmonizing with the conditions your breathing does not violate the conditions that you're trying to maintain. And in order to not violate those conditions, the body learns to breathe in a particular way, stimulating particular components in the body and your mind. Now, again, here we go from gross to subtle meaning that we harmonize with the breath and then we harmonize with the certain organ movements in the body or you harmonize with the blood flow and so on and so forth. Again, gross to subtle. So that is the way I approach standing work in all internal as I do. The traditions themselves may use it differently, but um, this is how I do it. This is how I approach it. The first question is about how one approaches the learning internal arts, mainly because I dabble in a lot of different uh, movement modalities and uh, martial arts, for lack of a better word. And uh, some of them, a fair few of them, happen to be internal styles. So uh, the question was, how do I navigate all these different styles, that, which are very different, uh, even though they may have broad, high-level principles that they're consistent with in terms of the actual realization of the technology they are and can be very different so my friend's question was how do we navigate the different internal arts and how do we train them simultaneously and um, there are specific conditions with the mind that apply when doing whether it's yoga or whether it's standing work uh, with some traditions, they have that input. So even when I'm using those mental models or perceptual models or particular types of experiences that I'm going for, I'm using these conditions. So I'm not completely subscribing to exclusively experiencing that. I'm bringing it into this framework. So uh, this probably, would I would say, is how I approach all internal lives. I try to bring in what they're trying to achieve in the cleanest, most accurate possible way to the framework that I'm exploring. And this is a exploratory learning process. Sometimes those things can't be integrated into my framework, so I have to actually improve my framework. And sometimes um, you realize that those things don't make any sense because you lose all the advantages of the rest of the framework if you end up doing things this way. So those aspects I discard. And this is not a method that I would say is better than every other method, but this is what works for me because I do so many things. I have to find that common substrate that makes the majority of everything that I engage in possible and functional and efficient. So this, would, I would say, is the uh, approach that I use to learning multiple arts. Again. Very 
I'm, take, I'm talking here about the internal physical configuration. So when it comes to the actual use of the art or the spirit of the art, they have different strategies and tactics and so on and so forth. So I'm not trying to mod mod modify those things because if you modify those things, you're not really doing the art. But I'm basically adapting how the so-called so external structures of these arts or external methods of these arts are embodied in me. I'm on my own journey, which is spiritual for the most part for me, and the physical expression is just how the spiritual expression or the spiritual state reflects in the body. So I have to adapt it to what I'm doing in terms of the internal methods. So, uh, so that is a brief, uh, brief pointer to um, how I approach my own solo training um, now couple of things to say is that when you work with resistance training, I said you go from gross to subtle. And uh, so when you go from gross to subtle, you want to make sure that um, at a subtle level, you stimulate all layers of experience. So what I do is that um, the state that I'm operating on might be a composition of say five different technologies layered on each other in a particular way. So I would apply the resistance training to each one of these layers and uh, apply the mobility exercises to each one of these layers and all the layers together as one whole. The reason for this is that when you use it all as a whole, because the capacity of the mind and the body improves you need a lot more challenging environments to stimulate them, uh, those facets, compared to if you were to basically stimulate those facets one at a time or one layer at a time. So that's the reason why I basically apply to the different facets and then to all facets together. Um, of course, sometimes the facets can't be independently excised. They have to be layered. So facet 1, facet 1 and 2, facet 1, 2 and 3, facet 1, 2, 3 and 4, and facet 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, all together. So uh, this is kind of um, how I work with resistance. Um, in terms of the loads and the mobility involved, you just basically first start at any layer. You first start with the lowest amount of resistance possible where you can perceive what's going on. The reason why you do it is that safety is paramount. You want to make sure that you don't do something wrong and damage yourself. You start with the least possible resistance that gives right stimulation or you give you reasonable, discernible stimulation. And then as you become more familiar with it and as you recognize the integration of it, as you recognize the effortlessness of the integration of working with the resistance, then you slowly increase the load and increase the range so that uh, you're never really pushing us, putting yourself too far because, you know, if you're putting yourself too far and you have to work through a range of motion, you might be fine, but 5% uh, within this range of motion, you might simply lose it and you might end up damaging something because when you're working with the internal modalities, you're using a lot more components than your prime mover muscles, and some of these components are not strong enough to have or to sustain the resistance of a large magnitude so they can damage it. So you can hurt yourself really badly if you're not careful and if you're not mindful and you don't have clear discernment as to what you're doing. If you want to be a cowboy and do like crazy ways to impress everyone else, to impress yourself, then most probably with the internal modality, you'll end up hurting yourself badly. So um, that's probably the most important thing when you're doing this work because this work can be very dangerous. I'm not saying this to make me feel special. I'm just saying this because I've been there, I've hurt myself, and I'm very careful these days. So um, that is basically how I approach solar training. So um, hope you guys um, 
got something useful out of it or at least thought provoking and um, I hope that there was some um, light shed into how I uh, train different internal arts as well. Thank you very much for listening. Hi everyone. It's a beautiful winter day in uh, Brisbane, Australia. We don't really get much um, snow or anything like that. We don't actually get any snow at all. But we do get um, lovely rainy days like this in the Brisbane winter. So yeah, welcome to the Brisbane winter, which is a bit like the English summer actually. So uh, today um, I decided to record this because I've been putting this off for quite some time. Um, I want to talk about uh, two things, basically, like things that I have uh, been promising to my friends that I will be recording, which I haven't quite gotten around to for quite some months now. So first of all, apologies for this taking so long. <laughs> I know I promised that I'm going to record this like ages ago. But um, the good news is better late than never, I would think. So. Um, here we go. Listen to me now.